Welcome back to Fresh Outlook. We continue to look at more with what's making international headlines this week and turn our attention to Egypt. Now this week, an Egyptian court sentenced 528 Muslim Brotherhood supporters to death after charging them with the murder of a police officer and of other violent acts in August 2013. Here are some alarming numbers. 2,500 Egyptians killed, more than 17,000 injured, and more than 16,000 arrested in protests since the military ouster of President Mohamed Morsi. So this country right now, uh, just not even with the, the protests and, and all the killings, but the economy is just a mess. I, I don't know, uh, today uh, we also heard that the uh, military officer is not going to, has withdrawn his uh, presidency. So who's going to lead this country out of all this turmoil? It's a country in free fall, ultimately. I was in the region, I was in, uh, I spent much, much of last summer in Tunisia, I was watching from just sort of the sidelines, um, speaking actually to Egyptians who had, had left uh, just before the military crackdown. And uh, again, this is a country with tremendous, tremendous institutional problems. Uh, it seems rudderless at the moment. The economy is in free fall. Um, unemployment, they say, for, for young people, uh, something like 45 percent. That seems on that's, the low that's side. Low side. That, that, would be that's that would be very conservative figures. I mean, one of, one of the big areas of the Egyptian economy that brings in hard currency uh, is tourism, which is virtually yeah, down to zero. Yeah, nobody wants to go there now. Like, who, well, who would go to the Red Sea resorts I, now? I actually was, uh, was doing some Google research, obviously. We were uh, looking at some things before the show. And all it says, if you put in Egypt, is don't all go. These, no, it, it, all these cheap, cheap flights to Egypt. Come, tourist <laughs> tra box, and, get to and, Egypt. and nobody's going. And, and they've lost billions and billions of yeah. dollars. And I just don't know how they're ever going to recover economically at this point. But they are, they are an important, important country. And there's I mean, so much history there. It means to be, a, you know, a hot spot, you know, for tourism. You know, and otherwise, you know, but it's so brutal. That's the problem. You know, they are electrocuting people. They are threatening women with rape. They are doing these terrible things in Egypt. I mean, I mean, just this kid, a 15-year-old kid, was, was taking a tape on his phone, and they let, held him for 34 well, days. How about charging 528 supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, with death? I mean, yeah, that, that's, an, that's an extreme case. Um, when I was in the region, there was very quiet support, quiet, tacit support for the military intervention. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood is a not a... a, a social political stakeholder that uh, succeeded in any way in taking Egypt out of the crisis, which was sort of the ruins of the Arab Spring. They had one year to do it, and it, it's not that they did nothing. They actually regressed. They really brought the country back. They hurt the tourism sector. They hurt the commercial sector. Absolutely. Uh, the, the around 10 to 12 percent of the Christian minority, the Coptics, uh, were in absolute flight. Uh, they were leaving en masse. It was very, I mean, they were not a good caretaker government. And well, so the I military thought it, that they should step in. But I want to take, t talk about the military uh, leader. He was going to run for the presidency, mm -hmm. and now he's withdrawn as of today. Is that a step forward or is that a step back? I don't see how it's good. I mean, you know, it's just, just yeah. turmoil. I mean, it's just absolute turmoil. There's been a spiral. You know, in the last year, it's gone from here all the way to the abyss. It's really unfortunate. I would, I'm, I'm not as confident that it was in, in a really in a plus point. It, it had reached a point of quiet stabilization well, after people, the military a, a intervention. A lot of people are protesting that he's withdrawn from the... Yeah. Uh, Egypt, it can't be a e positive thing. It's not a positive thing, but if you look back over the last 50 years or so, since, since the Nasser period in the 50s and 60s, Egypt has typically functioned fairly well under very, very strong leadership dare I even say, like authoritarian re leadership that was propped up by the U.S. for the longest time. Mubarak was a very much supported by all, all parties of the White House. Uh, the big problem now uh, is to see who's going to step in the There's void. There's no leadership. Yeah, there There's is no, no leadership. There's no anarchy. Leadership. It looks like anarchy, basically. It absolutely does. And another country that where we're starting to see some anarchy with upcoming elections as well, we're talking about, of course, Afghanistan. Yeah. Now, President Hamid Karzai is now barred constitutionally from seeking a third term. So this will be Afghanistan's first ever democratic handover of power. But the Taliban attacked the Election Commission headquarters in Kabul in the latest in a series of high-profile attacks. If the violence resembles the 2004 and 2009 elections, what does this say about the expensive intervention into Afghanistan? Absolute failure. I mean, Didi and I will probably disagree on this. Um, this was maybe, and, and I would say that Iraq is even more of a fiasco, if there was a post-9-11 case where the U.S. could have said, okay, we're going to go after somewhere, Afghanistan 
maybe was partially convincing. But there have been so many missteps since then. And ultimately, it's not a country that, that succeeded in, in any pattern of governments under the so governance under the Soviet Union, under the British. I hate to bring up the old historian's expression that this is a place where empires go to die. The US has given it a good go, and it's a failure. And I, I don't know, I don't see, see a peaceful future without the Taliban in Afghanistan. And just this past week also, you know, you, you talk about spending time in Tunisia. I spent time in Afghanistan uh, working on the landmine uh, mm -hmm. removal. And they just had two of the peacekeeping operation fo folks uh, that were killed. They had a Swedish um, journalist that was also killed and about 21 people in a restaurant. So this is, if this really escalates uh, in the next week, uh, elections are April 5th, uh, what are your thoughts about Well, I don't think there's any surprise that the Taliban would attack the headquarters. I mean, democracy is messy. It's going to be difficult in this country. So it doesn't mean it will not succeed. I mean, just because there was one attack doesn't mean that it won't work. I mean, you know, I think we can at least uh, uh, be positive about it. I mean, who knows? Maybe it won't. Afghanistan is very difficult and tricky. I wouldn't say it's a total failure, but it's, you know, well, it's Afghanistan. It, it, it is a, a, a much different country. Very you different. Can, I mean, Iraq has a literacy rate of 78 uh, percent, or Afghanistan's is closer to 40 percent. It's a much, much different country, more so than Egypt as well. Well, I mean, you could say that, that Iraq, because of the secular tradition that it had in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s under Saddam Hussein, that there was more gender engagement, women were allowed to be educated, that was not the case and will not be the case under the Taliban. Uh, it will not be... It has improved. It, it no, has improved. but it will not be, I mean... I think saying no, Saddam Kabul, Hussein gave women the rights to anything is... He did, is, it's true. Oh, you come should, on. You should read about it. Yeah, well, what, uh, Ka yeah, Kabul is different. Started. In Afghanistan, Kabul is where things are happening, but when you go into the provinces, I've spoken with ex-Marines, uh, I have several contacts uh, in the diplomatic community and ex-colleagues of mine at the UN and quietly they say that really the only sort of pro positive movement happens in the urban centers. As soon as you go into the provinces, you're stepping back into the 15th century. Yeah, well, I, 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 I agree with that, but it's, Chicken yeah. Street and lots of places in Kabul sure. has certainly, certainly progressed uh, very much so. True. We do have to move to a different topic right now, and is of course the global mystery of Flight 370. Malaysia's acting transportation minister vowed to continue the search for possible survivors from Flight 370 three weeks after it crashed into the Indian Ocean, giving some families some what some people are calling false hope. Is this a good thing to be doing right now? I mean, I think you know, we've heard first that they did find some objects, then uh, we get other other statements saying they didn't find objects. It's going back and forth, Didi. Yeah, if we want to talk about total fail, I think we will both agree on this, that the Malaysian government and airlines have mishandled this so badly. I mean, they send out a text to all these families. Oh, uh, everybody's dead. Thanks for playing. Really? I mean, how insensitive can you get? And now they're saying, oh, well, there may be survivors, but they have no proof of that. And then they find parts, and then they don't. It's a mess. It's very, very upsetting. Yeah, the, la the lack of transparency, not only on the part of Malaysian Airlines, but this is something that the Malaysian government should yes. have been much, much more transparent on, and they really should have had sort of all hands on deck to make sure what kind of communications go out to these poor victims. And they wouldn't Absolutely. take any help. Cannot, they wouldn't take any help. It was ridiculous. I yeah. want to weigh in with uh, Dr. Bart Rossi. Uh, he's down in uh, Florida. Thanks for uh, joining us on the show today. Hey, Dr. Bart, uh, one of the questions, uh, you know, when you talk about this false hope that some of these families are getting and watching this 24-7 media cycle, uh, I, I can't imagine what they're going through. No, they're, they're going through a very difficult time, obviously. And I, I think the, the Malaysian authorities handled this wrongly in, in many respects. In particular, I think they should have told the families that they're going to look at everybody on board the plane, starting with the pilots, who, by the way, I think have a very good psychological profile. But nonetheless, we need to look at all the people on the plane to see if there are psychological reasons for a, a diversion here. For example, is there a side of somebody on that plane, whether it's religious or political, that's going to result in a diversion of this plane for some unknown reason? and even get the pilots out of the picture because there is nothing perhaps in their background. But they didn't present that right from the psych psychology standpoint, and they didn't, they didn't really do a good job in communication. And now the families are left with uh, this emptiness and this sadness that is so overwhelming that I, that I think it's really quite striking. I want to talk about the media, and I'm never going to point a finger at the media because I don't want anybody <laughs> pointing a finger at me. How about that? Um, but does the media need to continue to report uh, China and Australia? Well, they, they think they saw a satellite. They think they found the objects, uh, and then it turns out that it's not. 
Is this healthy for anybody in Malaysia versus, uh, or here in the United States? I mean, it just seems to be reporting about nothing. I don't think it's going to end. I mean, you know, people are so fascinated with this. It's such an international incident that's but, never happened. Uh, is it good now? But are they going to keep doing it? Yeah. But, for sure. no, but I was going to say, is it worth, you know, I purposely didn't put in there that they, that China and Australia thought they found something because then they came out with something, another report just a few minutes ago saying, no, that, that was nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, you may not say it, but I will. CNN, this is all they're reporting on. There's nothing else. It, it is, is, it is every minute. The CNN reports on this, and you know, when it's over and over and over again, they keep rehashing it. Yeah, it's, it's coming to the point of almost media desensitization. It's a constant bombardment, and what's really regretful about all of this is we have to think about the families, the survivors, and Absolutely. the victims. Absolutely, you've got a lot of families here from Malaysia and the states, and I, 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 but but not reporting any facts and going 24/7. It's all speculation. It's all spe uh, which of course ha that, ha that can happen in, in a news cycle. But this has been for three weeks, and I'm just very surprised that they're still running with a 24/7. And that's got to be an emotional roller coaster for the for the families of, of and and uh, uh, of the victims. I have a friend in New York who tragically lost both her parents in a uh, plane crash, and she was explaining to me uh, there was no massive media presence. It was a smaller event, but still quite tragic, obviously. And uh, she really went through and up and down in terms of getting information and uh, this with all the media on top of not getting any concrete information getting misguided uh, signals from the Malaysian authorities. It's a circus. It, it really it is. is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Burr, uh, what would be your advice to the families? Do you turn off the, uh, the television at this point? You know, I, I think it's kind of hard to follow the television. I agree with you, Mia, that I think that the, the media here has, has is creating breaking news every second, but it's the same news that we heard before. And I think that's that's playing on the families. Uh, I would suggest to the families really to just try to take a look at what's real, you know, what concrete evidence uh, does result here, and just go with that because this, this constant breaking news, but it's pretty much the same story all over again, is really wearing people out. Well, and I think it has something to do with integrity as well. Because remember when the victims, when the families found out that news, they were told that that was the end of, uh, that they were that was dead. The end of, right. They said, you're lying, you're lying. I mean, they didn't believe them because they kept hearing all these stories. They but were in the, disbelief. The transportation minister for Malaysia came out and said, we think there's still hope today. Oh, terrible. No coordination. It's just a circus. It's so hard on these poor families. No, I think that I think there is regional coordination between China, Southeastern Asian countries, and and Australia. And it's encouraging to see Australia take the lead on this. Um, it's probably the only country really with r trustworthy institutions to to deal with this type of situation. But still, I mean, not nah, to speak as a political scientist. Uh, this only speaks to sort of the weak institutional culture of of Malaysian authorities. But don't they, you they think Malaysia be has been strangely uh, isolated. They, they wanted to isolate themselves, which makes no sense. Why wouldn't they take the help? Why wouldn't they take the help from the United States earlier? They wouldn't do it, especially in the beginning. Well, I do agree with you, Dr. Maresco, in terms of it's been encouraging to see at least the countries come together and Australia take the lead on, on this search. And we certainly hope by next week we are talking about some, some other positive aspect of this story. Absolutely. And don't go away, everyone. When we do come back, we will talk about some of the top topics from here in the U.S. when Fresh Outlook returns.